travel. Um, I call this meeting to order. It's the 1,147th regular meeting of the Board of Library Trustees. Um, we're here at Malga Cove Library Community Room, and it's May 18th. It's uh, 6 uh, 1 p.m. Um, I'd like to call the meeting to order. Um, may I have a roll call, Executive Assistant Bender? Certainly. Trustee Butler? Here. Trustee Easton? Here. Trustee Park? Here. Trustee Uno? Here. Trustee Wong? Here. Madam President, we have a quorum. Uh, thank you. Um, salute to the flag. Okay. Um, Mr. Wong, mm -hmm. I mean, Trustee Wong, would you mind leading us? Ready? Okay. Uh, could I have a motion to adopt the agenda, please? I move to adopt the agenda. Um, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, we are moving on to president's remarks and board member comments. Any uh, board member comments today? I just want to um, make note that uh, this is uh, Asian Pacific American Heritage Month, and I noticed um, that uh, on the PVLD website that there is a new um, uh, uh, link to uh, celebrate our stories. And I believe that was a build initiative or an EDI initiative. And I wanted to just uh, draw your attention to the, um, uh, the monthly celebrations um, uh, that the library also supports. And there's um, a podcast, uh, uh, shows books to read that um, uh, address the um, the celebration of of the month. Um, so I encourage everyone to look at that. Anyone else? Okay. Um, communications and comments from the public concerning the items not on the agenda. Do we have any? No cards received. No cards. Okay. Thank you. Uh, consent calendar. Uh, could I have a motion to approve the consent calendar? I move we accept the consent calendar as written. Okay. Uh, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes. Oh, I actually have a, a comment. Did you want to make the announcement that the libraries are closed? Um oh, um, well, I mean, I, I uh, Sure, all libraries will be closed on Monday, May 29th in honor of Memorial Day. Um, and we did have a special closed session meeting on May 8th and um, earlier today, no action was taken. Um, and there will be another special closed session board meeting on Friday, June 9th at 3 p.m. in the Purcell meeting room. Thank you for the reminder. Okay, um, I believe we're on item eight. We do not have any um, items removed from the consent calendar, so we can move on to upcoming Board of Library Trustee conferences and events, Director Addington. Great, thank you very much, Madam President. So there's a couple listed here um, on your agenda, the first being um, on June 10th and 11th, Saturday and Sunday, the Palos Verdes Street Fair and Music Festival will be happening. Um, this is just an informational update for the trustees should they be interested in attending. This is uh, sponsored and put on by the Chamber of Commerce here in Palos Verdes. The library will not have a booth or a table at the event, but it is a fun event if you're interested in attending. Um, we've also noted that um, on Saturday, June 17th is our big Doors Open Peninsula event. You will hear more about that in just a moment. There are a couple that I just wanted to also acknowledge that are coming up uh, in May that are not listed, one of which is the Serving with a Purpose uh, Conference. We've mentioned it many times before, and both Trustees Park and UNO will be in attendance this year, but just wanted to acknowledge that it was coming up. 
Um, that same day, which um, may inhibit some of the participation, but I think we have plenty of people attending, uh, the city of Rolling Hills Estates has very generously offered to uh, craft a proclamation for our Doors Open Peninsula event. And at their 7 p.m. city council meeting that night, they will be presenting us with that. Uh, Mayor Britt Huff has, um, uh, according to the proclamation and the resolution, will announce June 17th as Doors Open Peninsula Day. Uh, we will say it's June 17th, 2023, not an ongoing annual event, but simply the one day. And as a show of support for that particular event, we're incredibly grateful and thankful to the city of Rolling Hills for that. We've heard rumors that another city may do that as well. So uh, if so, we'll certainly let the board know. And uh, again, just on the record and for anybody who may be watching at home, uh, a very big thank you to the city of Rolling Hills for that. I will be in attendance uh, as will um, uh, Trustee Butler and uh, Monique Sugimoto, our archivist, will all be there that evening. And I think I RSVP'd oh, and, late. Yes, uh -huh. President Easton as well. So we will have a nice representation. Okay, wonderful. Well, the only thing I would add is at the street fair, the Chamber of Commerce young entrepreneurs will be selling their products. So mm -hmm. it's uh, there's about 15 of them. They've come up with some fabulous ideas. So if you do go, look for the young entrepreneurs. They're, uh, they've really done a good job this year. Great, great, thank you. Uh, Dope 2023 event update. Yes. Um, well, I, I think uh, mm -hmm. to, to follow up with uh, some of the wonderful news we heard from the city of Rolling Hills and about our fabulous June 17th date, we have with us this evening, uh, Monique Sugimoto, um, our uh, local history archivist, who's going to be telling us a little bit more about Doors Open Peninsula. So Monique. Great, thanks very much. Um, and um, I, I'm glad to be here uh, tonight. I just wanted to give you a brief update on where we are with the Doors Open Peninsula planning. Um, just to follow up, first of all, on the proclamations, um, it's Rolling Hills Estates. Um, but we also have a proclamation uh, that the other cities are creating. So we have one from Rolling Hills and also from Rancho Palos Verdes oh, um, okay. and Palos Verdes Estates. Um, is also going to be issuing a proclamation. I just don't know when um, that date is. Um, the Rolling Hills proclamation date is going to be on at their May 22nd um, uh, uh, council meeting, and they, that starts at seven o'clock. Um, RPV is going to do it on June 6th, and their uh, council meeting starts at seven. And if PVE does theirs um, next week on May 23rd, uh, their uh, City Council meeting meets at 630. Um, they are going to get back with me uh, to see about uh, whether they're doing it on uh, the 23rd or not. So I will let you know um, about that. Um, most of our sites are finalized uh, and we are now working studiously with the, uh, the brochure um, and going through uh, several different revisions. Um, just to give you an idea, it's going to be a 20 page brochure um, listing the 56 sites that we have collected. Um, that includes the um, uh, historical society designated plaques and also um, a number of organizations um, on the peninsula. Um, the Laventa Inn reception is uh, the planning for that is, is going. You should have received um, an invitation, uh, and that's going to be on the 15th. The purpose of the Laventa Inn reception is really to um, is for our um, local officials, our board, the friends board, um, or the executive board and friends uh, to kind of just get together and say, this is, you know, we're all doing this together. Our dope sites are going to be represented there. So it should be kind of a nice um, way to kick off the event. Um, the uh, the hub planning, we just had um, a staff meeting or a, a hub committee, staff committee meeting today. Um, that is going really well. Uh, the hub uh, right now, um, as you have probably seen in the newsletters, we are going to have um, the PV Symphonic Band there. We'll have cake. We have, um, I think we are up to about 22 or 23 uh, community uh, tables or booths, and that includes the library. Um, so if you, you are welcome and uh, to come and participate in that, if you'd like to help staff the tables, that would be great as well. 
Uh, we're uh, right now the schedule is probably going to be our elected officials, um, and I think Jonathan, we're working, or Trustee Butler, we're working on that. Um, we're thinking about an 11:30 cake cutting and a singing of the Foxtrot. Um, so that will yeah. um, be happening. Um, so I would encourage you all to come. That should be kind of a fun um, event. Um, I think that is, I, I think that's kind of it in a nutshell, but I'm happy to answer any questions. Uh, Monique, will the 1130 uh, Foxtrot be um, for the library sort of um, moment? Um, or is it is it um, broader than that? It's broader than that. So okay. the hub is where um, community groups are going to be. They, they'll be set up there. And also the public can come in uh, and grab their brochures and either be off and be on their way to go okay. and you know do their exciting uh, adventure or they can hang out. Um, but the Foxtrot is going to be a sing along for everybody who is at the hub at the time that we're at that the band is going to be playing it. I see. But it uh, the event itself starts at 10. Is that right? Uh, it, it starts at nine o'clock. So, nine. Right. Okay. So it's nine to four is when nine we're having four. the tables um, set up or kind of opened at that time. So there'll be people who can come and just check in, get their thing and go on. Or we have the library uh, Young Readers is uh, developing a, um, a number of different games uh, for the PVLD uh, table site there. So mm -hmm. people can stay there and hang out with us. Great. Yeah, and I'll share that just in the community tables, Rotary will have a table, there'll be a table for the friends, a table for the library. Um, and again, we can definitely put this in a more, you know, uh, comprehensive email to you, but they just today kind of figured out where and when all some of those will be. So we would encourage the trustees if you want to man uh, work the table with us for a little bit, we uh, would be uh, thrilled to have you uh, both myself and uh, Deputy Director Roy will be working the table all day. So it'll be a, a really wonderful event. And there's going to be ponies, I've heard. Mm -hmm. oh, there yes. will be two therapy ponies. So <laughs> yeah. um, you can meet two of the therapy ponies, which will be exciting. We'll also have a fleet of Model T cars from the Long Beach Model T Club. I think we'll have about 11 cars on the field. Um, and this is, again, at the Malaga Coast School um, site, which is where the original rally was held. Great. Thank you, Monique. We also um, received a newsletter from you, I believe, um, uh, from the DOPE committee, or I don't know if it came to all of the PVLD uh, newsletter subscribers, but um, that had a, um, a flyer that you could copy and send to friends um, and um, acquaintances to let them know about the event. Great. Yeah, that's yeah. Yeah, I do think you had to opt into it. Oh, you had to opt into it. Okay. Into the newsletter. That's right. Into the newsletter. Okay. Um, one thing I also wanted to mention as part of the library's kickoff for DOPE, um, we are also on June 10th holding a YSPS event, which is um, the public scanning event that we started. Uh, we started doing these back in 2016, um, where the public can come in. Um, bring uh, up to five photographs to be scanned on the spot, and we will collect the story. Um, we're digitizing the materials, and then afterwards we'll upload it onto our digital repository. Um, but the idea is we had this one amazing photo from 100 years ago, so let's the community work together, you know, contribute their photographs so that 100 years from now, um, we will have documented um, where we are in, in this space. So I would encourage everybody to come to that as well. That's on June 10th. Um, and it is the same day as the street fair, um, but mm -hmm. that is um, scheduled for to be here at the Peninsula Center. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Monique. Thank, Thank you, Monique, you so Monique. much for taking the time to visit with us today. Thank you. Fifty-six sites is amazing. I know. Yes, that is amazing. I think this is a, a tremendous example of how the library can pull the community together on a project. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, you know, Jennifer, you and Monique and the whole staff should be congratulated on what you've been able to do. I remember. Yeah. Mm -hmm. A year ago, this thing was in its infancy, mm -hmm. 
and there was a detailed plan put together yeah. by you all, and uh, you made it all come true, and I've, including a huge billboard on Hawthorne. I know, isn't that great? Right, so it's just I'm, great. Yeah, and I'm truly not going to take credit for this one. Mm -hmm. um, they have had my uh, absolute and unmitigated support throughout it all, mm -hmm. but there's no doubt that the local history center, Monique uh, Sugimoto, Michelle Frick, and her team, and the the committee themselves have really been the ones who've done it. So yeah. I've been supporting and and behind them a hundred percent, but they have absolutely made this happen. And uh, and to be honest, the friends of the library prior to their previous executive director's um, departure, mm -hmm. they were also super active in getting out into the community and oh. and making those connections. So really, a, a wonderful effort on everybody's part. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you, Monique. Um, I, I also have attended the YSPS events in the past, and I encourage um, everyone to check it out. Um, you bring some photos in, and there's a, a questionnaire, and you write what the photo is about and what it means to you, and it becomes digitized and part of the library collection. So um, it's a wonderful family event, too, um, as well. Okay, any questions, comments? Okay, we'll move on to the mobile library update. Um, Adult Services Manager Polizzi, Letty, thank you for coming. Thank you. Um, so let me share my screen with you. Oh, uh, perfect. So good evening, um, my name is Letty Polizzi. I'm the Adult Services Department Manager, and I'm here to give you an overview of the Mobile Library Services Report. All the information and numbers on these slides are in that report, which you should have a copy of in your board packet. Uh, in, in my previous job for LA County Public Library, I was the community outreach coordinator, uh, providing outreach to 87 community libraries and supervising four make mo vehicles. I was part of the planning, launching, and supervising of these um, makerspace vans. Uh, and because of this experience launching this larger service, I was asked to create a proposal for PVLD mobile library services. To help with this project, I formed a committee that included every facet of public services because we are essentially compacting the brick and mortar library services into a mobile vehicle, it was essential to have their expertise on how this can be accomplished. Having their input and ideas also created transparency between departments on how each would be involved in the process. We met every two weeks starting in September of 2022 through January of this year and worked collaboratively to bring this report together. We were tasked with creating a cost breakdown of mobile library services on the peninsula. In researching and gathering information for mobile services, it was important to support our mission and vision, as well as our priorities as we move forward, uh, where this service needed to connect and inspire while creating opportunities for patrons to connect, create, learn, and share, and also build an equitable and sustainable future. Before researching a bookmobile and the cost, it was important that we get feedback from the community to learn about the community, what the community actually needs or wants. That feedback would help us identify what the mobile library services would actually look like. We worked in three stages. The first stage started back in October of 2022, collecting community feedback. We reached out to community partners and patrons to ask them what mobile library services look like to them. You have already reviewed uh, that initial report at previous board meetings. It was a community feedback report. And the second stage is using that feedback to help us define the library services and what equipment and staffing is required to meet the needs of the community. The third stage is conducting research and making suggestions for vehicles and staffing based on the needs of service. The first stage was community feedback. As I mentioned, we connected with community partners starting in October 2022 through December. We hosted outreach tables to ask the community what kind of service they would like to see in a bookmobile. Book, excuse me, bookmobile. 
Staff went out to ECU Park, PV Art Center, George F. Canyon Center, Golden Cove Shopping Center, and Lunada Bay Market. We hosted community conversations at Peninsula Center Library, at Malga Cove Library, and at Merrill West Library. We partnered with PBUSD PTA to host a special session for their organization. We also reached out to PV Village, PVP Parks and Recreation, and PV and PVE Cares to see if they wanted to host a community conversation session or table. They declined, but however, they helped us promote the planned sessions we were hosting at, with their contact mailing list. As I mentioned, you have already reviewed the feedback and outcomes from the community feedback report at previous board meetings. So you know that one of the main outcomes is that we found two communities that were being underserved by PVLD. East Rancho Palos Verdes and the Lunada Bay communities have a large population of non-patrons living in the PVLD service area. This, made clear, this was made clear when we spoke to the community members at the outreach tables in these communities. Much of the feedback we got from the community conversations was little to no interest in a bookmobile, but when we visited the East RPV and Lunada Bay, they, were, they would share that a bookmobile would be great to have and they would visit it. When asked what kind of service they would like to see, they said access to books, story time at the park, and overall learning about the library services in the community. The second stage was defining services. We took the feedback from the community and pulled out key services mentioned to see how the bookmobile would be able to meet those needs. This included the delivery of books, story time, and promoting library services. In order to meet those needs, the bookmobile would have to be stocked with popular books and bestsellers, best, I'm sorry, and bestsellers for kids, teens, and adults. The books would be exclusive to the bookmobile and not circulate with the rest of the collection at the three branches. The bookmobile would need to be stocked with supplies to provide story time as well as other programming as scheduled. It should have a regular schedule to deliver, to deliver and pick up books at Lunada Bay and East RPV. It should be available to attend community events and equipped with tables and canopies to create a welcoming environment for patrons to stop by. In the past, we have received requests from neighboring assisted living facilities to provide bookmobile services. So a regular stop at these locations uh, would also be recommended. Overall, the bookmobile is an outreach vehicle where we'll be attending all community events on the peninsula, like Whale of a Day, uh, the Rolling Hills Estates Earth, Earth Day, the uh, PV Street Fair, and the Farmer's Market. This will be marketed to the community, to all the community organizations on the peninsula, where they can reach out and book the bookmobile using an online form featured on PBLD website. Stage three was researching the vehicle and making uh, staffing recommendations based on the service needs. Early on, due to the narrow roads and steep hills on the peninsula, we had already decided not to suggest a large bookmobile that are usually the size of a school bus. We wanted our vehicle to be more agile and easy to drive. So from the beginning, we had a Ford Transit type of van in mind. As part of our research, we reached out to neighboring libraries that currently use this type of vehicle. We visited Long Beach Public Library, LA County Public Library, and reached out to Orange County Public Libraries, all who use a Ford Transit for their mobile library service needs. Each uses it differently and mainly uses it as a, as a delivery system rather than a bookmobile. Though LA County and Long Beach Public Library uh, use it as a makerspace delivery service, we were able to visit and see the safety features, the shelving and ramps they use to make deliveries easier. The Orange County Public Libraries were the only ones that used it as a bookmobile transporting books, Wi-Fi hotspots, and as an outreach van. Here's what a Ford Transit looks like with, with a marketing wrap. It has a two-person cabin, a side sliding door, and back double door opening. This vehicle does not require a special driving license or training. I myself have driven this vehicle for outreach events and it is very easy to drive. These vans were equipped with exterior lift gate, a safety access door from the cabin and interior storage that allowed for a person of average height to easily walk inside the vehicle. 
Danielle was able to locate a company that would build the bookmobile with all the shelving inside for books and out with the colorful marketing wrap. We, recommend it, we are recommending a Dodge Sprinter or Ford Transit, preferably hybrid or electric, equipped with shelving, Wi-Fi, electric generator, storage for supplies, exterior, exterior pull-out shade, and safety cameras. In order to be a true outreach van, it also requires that it is stocked with supplies, and this includes story time rugs, laptops, Wi-Fi hotspots, staff computers for circulation, uh, general library promotional materials, tables and chairs, and of course, other essential amenities that are added by a professional bookmobile vendor. <clears throat> Here's an example of what the interior of the book shelving would look like in a vehicle. And here's an example of a patron interaction of delivering books to the community. Um, notice the overhanging shade and the book carts on the side ready for browsing. So based on the services that the bookmobile will be providing, we are recommending a full-time librarian three. This classification is defined by human resources job description as a specialized, quote, specialized librarian assignment that requires substantial specialized skills and experience combined with specialized qualifications, end quote. We also recommend a part-time library clerk to help maintain the vehicle and help with circulation duties. We recommend the bookmobile would be out in the community three times a week, Tuesday through Saturday, making regular stops at parks, schools, and assisted living facilities, and attending regular community events. While 60% of their time will be spent out in the community, we estimate that 40% will be bringing back books to the library, replenishing supplies, coordinating with community organizations. So how much is this all gonna cost? <laughs> Based on the library services we have defined in this report and the staffing it requires to meet those needs, we have estimated the following costs. The vehicle with full customization is 250,000, which does not reflect current inflation prices. It will be outfitted with safety features, a generator, customization of interior, including the shelving and the marketing exterior wrap. The book collection initial setup costs will be $45,000. This would stock the vehicle and give us a collection uh, to have in storage to rotate it out. And of course, this is if we're starting from scratch. We estimated 40, I'm sorry, we estimated $20,000 yearly to maintain the collection thereafter. The supplies for the vehicle to conduct outreach to start were an estimated at $26,000. This is of course includes the one-time uh, setup cost of computers, iPads, pop-up canopies, book carts, in addition to replenishing story time supplies, rugs, art supplies, et cetera. And of course, the staff salaries, which include a full-time librarian three and a part-time library clerk, will be $140,000 a year. And here's a mock-up of the vehicle wrap the Bookmobile Committee came up with and is inspired by the services PL PVLD currently provides. Mm -hmm. Once we started summarizing this report, we were all very excited for this Bookmobile and its services that we called it our special unicorn of a Bookmobile, perfect for the peninsula. Thank you. Great. Any questions? Thank yeah, thank you, Letty. Um, uh, please go right ahead, everybody. Well, um, I understand the, the length 22 feet because I just have a box truck. So in that instance, you don't have a special license. Um, but you are talking about having a dedicated staff so they become very, very familiar with the operation right. and the height and weight and everything like that. How viable is it to get a hybrid or an electric version of this span? And does it affect the cost versus uh, a conventional engine? I uh, think that's a question, yeah, for Daniel. Yeah, I'll, I'll answer that one. Um, hybrid in this kind of formation are readily available. Okay, readily available. Mm -hmm. Electric less so. But, okay. Um, they do have limitations on the build out of fully electric vehicles, so it would probably end up being a hybrid. Okay, plug-in or normal? Uh, I believe it's normal hybrid, not plug-in. Okay, and because of the fact that, um, you know, our operation area is relatively compact, uh, I take it that, um, you know, doing hybrid would work okay? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, 
given the height specificity, uh, no way to store it on our roof. No. Even if it was the same one. Okay. Yeah. Because yeah, we, of the way the roof is structured, we couldn't pull anything up there that high. Um, you'll note that our recommendation would be to park it at the Mirror Lest Library because okay. we could pull into that parking lot easier, kind of, you know, reserve one of the spots on the far end, and that yeah. could be a, a spot for parking. Yeah. Now, by the way, I live on the Mirror Lest side, so I love it. <laughs> um, uh, the wonderful thing about Mirror Lest at night is, is that it's out there. One of the problems about Merrill Less at night is is out there. <laughs> uh, so in terms of lighting, security, whatnot, um, are we feeling good about it? Uh, yes, especially with the advent of the camera system as well. Okay. So we'd have more cameras covering that parking lot and that where that vehicle would be parked. So it, once we implement the new security update, which we have an update for later in the meeting. Yeah, because I think that once you have the parking lot gates with the chain, that's one thing. I'm just worried about things like spray cans. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think it's always a challenge. Mm -hmm. um, I hate to say it, but my car got egged here at the Malibu Cove Library once, and that was just a regular car. Um, you do, in some ways, take your chances, but as was mentioned, if if we move forward with the uh, camera system, we would have better, better cameras. We could certainly put some kind of a motion sensing light specifically around the vehicle itself, um, you know, and I think you, you hope for the best when it comes mm -hmm. to yeah. the quality of... Uh, patrons on the hill so i had a question letty what is a non-floating collection mm -hmm. oh yes yeah. so right now all our collection is floating which means that if you check out an item here at peninsula center and it gets returned at malaga cove it stays at malaga cove it's not sent back to peninsula center and oh. the same thing all the collection is just wherever it floats out in the community and where it gets returned that's where it stays Oh. So the bookmobile collection will be non-floating, which means the items kind of how this is how we have the teen annex right now. Well, I'm sorry, no. The so the items on the bookmobile would not be used to fill holds. They will not be used to be sent out to the community. But we will people would be able to return items to the bookmobile, and we'll just return them to the library. But they but if we have yeah, if we if we have items that are specific to the bookmobile, they won't be used to be going out to the to the branches. However, yes. it, as we service like the retirement committees, if someone actually wants to order a book uh, through our website from our from our primary collection, we could use the bookmobile to deliver on a regular schedule. I mean, I think we'd have to look into scheduling that and seeing how that would work, yeah. um, because. You know, like Letty was saying, right now you could check a book out from any of the three branches and return it to any of the three branches. It yeah. doesn't matter. And wherever you return it to, it just stays. Um, because it's a specialized collection and a bit more um, curated, yeah. if you returned a book to Malaga Cove, mm -hmm. we would want it to go back to the bookmobile, not just stay at Malaga Cove. Mm -hmm. So if we could schedule it appropriately and if we could get the cataloging in the system, to say, okay, I want to check out this book. I'm going to put it on hold, but I want to pick pick up my hold from the bookmobile. Mm -hmm. It could be that we could establish, and again, I'm not 100% promising yeah. this because we'd have to look at the scheduling of it. But if we were to able to say that the bookmobile would be at the Canterbury yeah. on the first Thursday of every month, yeah. if you said, I wanted to pick up my book from the bookmobile, the bookmobile would be at the Canterbury on the first Thursday, and you would know that that's when we would bringing we would be bringing any holds that were for the Canterbury on that day. Yeah, yeah um, exactly. So if when we're going to be, let's say we're concentrating on the RPV community where that park that we made our we did our outreach at, we would be scheduled there every two weeks, so they know that they could pick up their hold at the bookmobile. Yeah, because I think that that would be big, especially if you're dealing with a community that can't get around. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. And ideally, I mean, one of the reasons you really want a dedicated staff member is so that you can establish a, a monthly calendar yeah. and mm -hmm. say, this is your job is to be the bookmobile driver yeah. mm -hmm. slash librarian. 
um, and know that I'm going to be here and then here and then here. And you could actually create a monthly calendar for the bookmobile so that people knew I'm going to take my kid to the park <laughs> on this particular Thursday because the bookmobile is going to be there mm -hmm. um, and start getting that as part of our regular outreach and regular calendar. Um, we talked about could like anybody, if it was a, a van situation where anybody could drive it, could you rotate librarians, could various different people take on that job, but then you run into that challenge of somebody not understanding the vehicle, not really feeling very comfortable driving it, not knowing how to stop it, start the generator, get out all the shelving, put out the shade, and be on a schedule in such a way that they can get in, get set up in 10 minutes, do their services for three hours, pack it up, go to the next one. Only somebody who does yeah. that on a regular basis and really knows how mm -hmm. would, would truly feel comfortable yeah, and would have the ability to do that. Someone who's basically knows the ropes as opposed to amateur constantly. Yes. Right. And also it's very important to have somebody that is doing outreach, that is comfortable co uh, contacting community members, making that connection, talking to the community and getting that relationship going. If you're constantly trading off librarians, you kind of lose that connection. Mm -hmm. It's very important to have the one librarian that is actively out there constantly and they know, oh, that's the bookmobile librarian. So mm -hmm. it's it's really um, useful for the community to, to form that connection with that person. But it, um... I think it was Orange County you said was using their bookmobile in a manner similar to what you described for mm -hmm. us. Yes. Uh, how did, did they talk to you about how successful they thought that bookmobile was, what impact it had on the community? Oh, yeah. For them, it was very successful. They go out there every two weeks to this. They have a schedule of every two weeks visiting parks and also uh, community centers. So they've been able to reach a lot of young kids that don't have a library near them. And mm -hmm. so they're able to bring out books to them on a regular basis. They're, they're, there's other organizations that we that we know of that have a van like this, but they don't have regular schedule. So they most of the time it just sits there. But Orange County had a very successful um, plan where they schedule uh, their outings on a weekly basis. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what we were trying, you know, to yeah. go for is, um, you know, you don't want to spend all the money and hire the staff and get the collection mm -hmm. and get the, the, the vehicle. And then it's like the new fun, shiny thing for about yeah. six months. And then it sort of dies off. Mm -hmm. And we didn't want that. If you're going to put that kind of effort into it, yeah. especially since we have identified a couple of areas where we feel like it would really be beneficial so it's only, I think, if you've really got that dedicated staff, and like Letty said, somebody who's comfortable going out into the community, comfortable going to these places, setting up and talking about services, and even finding other opportunities, um, and then getting it on a schedule so you know that this is what you do. Even some of the very smaller things that I've heard, um, Placentia Library, for example, has a little outreach van, but it is literally their story time van. Mm -hmm. And they take it to like two parks, they do story time in the park, and then it goes right back home. Um, but that story time in the park is absolutely scheduled, is hugely popular, and it's their outreach event. Oh, we hope to do something a little more than just a story time in a park, mm -hmm. but it's only, I think, when you get it on a schedule and the community knows to expect it when you really start tapping into the benefits. Otherwise, it's just sort of a flash in the pan. Yeah. You know, you never know when it's going to show up. It's like the ice cream truck, you know. Yeah. Yeah. In, in, that, in that regard, yeah. you know, you talked about having it go to Whale the Day and other special mm -hmm. events like that. How do you build that into a schedule? In other words, if we're going to be at certain parks, certain days and times, is there going to be enough time for them to also go to these special events? How do we? Yeah, I mean, I think I think we know those big events. We know mm -hmm. when most of them are happening. Many of them are on Saturdays. Um, I think if you purposefully pick Tuesday afternoons and Thursday mornings or Monday afternoons. And then you can say, I mean, people understand that the mobile outreach van is going somewhere special. 
they understand that, oh, it's the PV street fair, which means the mobile outreach van is not coming to the park today because it's at the PV street fair. But if you can plan that ahead of time and you can, you know, have an online calendar that says, you know, sorry, we're not at where we regularly are because there's this one particular thing going on. Um, people understand that. They know that for whatever reason, you know, the thing is closed today. Um, but I think if around those specialty events, you have like a standard schedule, that's where, you know, again, you're going to kind of establish that routine. And if people, uh, if you say, well, we're not going to be here today because we're at whale of a day, then you encourage them to go to whale of a day. You, you know, we're not coming to the park today, but if you come to whale of a day, you're going to find us, you're going to see us, you're going to see the van, you're going to see your, the mobile outreach librarian that you love, and you're going to participate in a much broader community event. So it kind of is a cross promotional opportunity too. Okay, and I, I, I assume that you set it up for five, you had a schedule for five days, you know, three days out in the field and then a, a day of prep and a day of uh, something else. But that was because we had one, one full-time person there, right? So if, if it became wildly successful and we found that it would be helpful to have it out in the community more days, we might have to have, all it would really take is a, an extra librarian, right? Or an extra van. Or, an extra yeah. van. <laughs> or another van, yeah. Or another van, yeah. Because it, it is, it's, it's very time consuming. Having done this these types of outreach events with a van and a vehicle to actually have to upload everything up, take inventory, kind of uh, figure out where you're going to be taking, and then actually driving to the location, emptying it out. And then it's not just checking out books, it's talking to the people and then getting their feedback about, oh, a reader advisory. Can you help me with this computer? What can you do? You know, can we possibly book you for this event that's coming up at the local school? How can we reach out to you? And then go gathering, checking out books, then gathering up all that information and interaction that you had with the patrons, taking them back to the library, and unloading that and then doing the prep work all over again the following day for your following event. So we really do want to encourage a day in between events, mean especially the regular events. Of course, if a special event comes up, we could definitely ask another staff person to help out and go out to, you know, a special event at a school. But we want to make sure that the regular schedule on a weekly basis allows a day in between going out to events. I would say not to mention just the physicality of it. Yeah. You're not walking from your desk and going to a public service desk and sitting behind it and answering the phone and working mm -hmm. the computer. You are physically loading books and boxes, getting tchotchkes to give away, getting paper, getting pens, getting books that are being checked out, physically driving there, unloading everything, putting all the books out. I mean, it's a physical thing. We know just from hauling all the books to do a, a special event like Whale of the Day, at the end of the day, you're like, whoo, that was exhausting. Mm -hmm. So imagine if you did that three times a week. If you, you become better at it, you become more streamlined, you know what you need, you know what you don't. But just the physicality of driving somewhere, setting up, talking to people all day long, taking it down. So yeah, you have to make sure that that person doesn't get completely burnt out. Um, and then like, anyone else, they also would have vacation days, you know, and so you'd also want to make sure that, you know, if you had that secondary part-time person, that that person could back, back them up, fill in maybe when they're gone, or again, planning ahead, you might simply say, we're very sorry, but the bookmobile is not going to be there that day because of whatever scheduling issues. So I think you're as consistent as you can be while also being fluid and flexible. Well, based on uh, the Orange County experience, based off of Lay's experience, if we basically decide to go on this endeavor and we know what programs we want to run through the project, will we have metrics that we'll be able to go ahead and measure our, how we're doing? Um, we'll be able to go ahead and have yardsticks that we can say how we um, are progressing compared to our near peers in terms of reaching the the, out, the outcomes that we're looking for. So for example, 
utilization rates or, or whatnot? Sure. I mean, ultimately, you'd end up with how many books do you check out from the van? How many people are you uh, talking to? How many library cards are you issuing? You know, we ultimately would have all of those kinds of information. Yeah. How many times does the van go out? Where does it go to? Number of library cards, number of checkouts, um, you know. Yeah, if we had story hours, how many? Yeah, how, how many, many people attended? Yeah. yeah. If you. Just like at the this, library. Yeah. If you yeah. were doing some sort of special outreach event, even something as simple as, you know, we brought a craft and we did 200 crafts. I mean, you'd know that that was a very successful outreach event in that park that day. And I think one of the things we have to be available to do, Letty had an excellent point. Once you see it is when people say, oh, will you come to San Pedro Fourth Fridays? Oh, will you be part of the Friendship Bell celebration? Ooh, will you bring your van to? And suddenly you're in demand as an outreach opportunity because they want, just like we want people to come to Doors Open Peninsula, mm. they would say, hey, we're doing a big community event. Can you bring your outreach van? That would be amazing. So we have to be open and flexible to be able to accommodate those kinds of things because yeah. when they see it, people would be like, oh, that's really neat. We'd love to have you. Yeah, I yeah, guess but that, I'm sorry. Yeah, I mean, I guess what I'm thinking myself is, you know, we've got a number of, um, senior care, assisted care type facilities here on the hill. Sure. And, you know, once I start a program to a place like that, I would never want to go ahead and withdraw it. Mm -hmm. But well, I mean, I think you'd have to be, we'd have to be very intentional yeah. about setting something up that's like, you know, I don't think we'd ever want to start off with, we're going to beat you every week because that's just too much. Yeah. But I guess what I'm thinking to myself also is, you know, maybe there's certain characteristics of that one facility and its population where maybe it is being used, but I would like to know, is it being used well, or just kind of like lackluster from our perspective mm -hmm. so that we could go ahead and say, we're going to continue offering services, but maybe not like once a week, like every other week or something like that, you know? Exactly. Yeah. Let, Letty, I have a question for you. Um, mm -hmm. So when you did the community feedback um, and you determined that there were a couple of underserved areas and that the best may, way to maybe reach them is to um, offer the collection um, to to these areas. I noticed in the, some of the other um, library uh, districts that, you know, the, the mobile van was used for specific things like uh, printmakers or, 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 or there were other services that were provided. I was just wanted to make sure that you assessed um, the you know the needs of this community and that that is the best um, way to utilize the van versus you know maybe the tech services go out to the homes and yeah I don't know just throwing other possibilities out there knowing that the van is used for different purposes in different library districts. Yes, when we did our community conversations and our outreach tables, we threw out everything that the bookmobile could possibly offer. Because okay. this was a conversation that Jen and I had before we started this research. I said, we will need to know, do they want us to bring out 3D printers? Do they want us to, does it, do they want us to bring out a technology van, you know, to use computers? Do they mm -hmm. need, um, virtual reality, you know, something that'll be technical or for kids or do they want? And so we would kind of list all these things. Like, what do you want from this bookmobile? We could bring out computers to you. We could bring Wi-Fi and hotspots to you. Do you want books? Do you want, and they're like, yeah, books, bring books. So mm -hmm. every time we got to the book section, they'd be like, oh yeah, bring books. Oh, you bring books for kids. You know, I really, mm -hmm. I can't make it to the story time. It would be great to bring story time. Mm -hmm. And also when we, um, the assisted facility, the assisted facility aspect of it was mainly in the last couple of years and pre-COVID actually, we would go do outreach monthly to both the Canterbury and the, I forgot the name of the other one, the Belmont, I think it is. Belmont. Yeah. And so uh, we used to go out there uh, monthly and we would bring them books and we would offer them, oh, do you want us to show you how to use Libby? Do you need to, you know, we'll bring a computer, we'll show you, we'll do a demonstration. And they're like, no, we just want books. 
we just want books. Mm. So every feedback that we got from out in the parks and the and you know in the communities and even the feedback that we got from the assisted living facilities, they're not interested in the technology. Mm. They really just want a, a somewhere where they could pick up a book. That's it. Which is nice to hear. <laughs> That's encouraging. Yeah. Okay. Anybody else have any questions? Thank you, Letty, so much. This is very informative. I think this was an informational um, yeah, just presentation. Informational. I mean, we're uh, still, um, I think as far as like next steps, mm -hmm. you know, obviously we want to um, do a little more research and kind of maybe get some hard numbers on what a van might look like. Um, and then I think there's an opportunity to really come together with the friends. Um, we were kind of hoping mm -hmm that if they could get an, an executive director in place that mm -hmm. we could start a conversation. One thing I think that a mobile outreach would be is a, a wonderful capital campaign opportunity for the Friends of the Library. Uh, it could be joint and even in the branding that Letty was showing you was kind of a jointly branded Friends of the Library, um, uh, PDLD highlighting some of the wonderful things that we do like the Celebrate Your Stories pages, mm -hmm. like our um, local history center. Um, but, but kind of starting there also perhaps with the friends and, mm -hmm. and seeing, you know, what kind of, uh, mm -hmm. what it would generate with them that maybe we could go into this then in a partnership. And of course, looking at what the staffing would be and what, you know, how we would of course pay for it. Mm -hmm. Um, as we go into the next agenda item and talking about the budget, nothing mm -hmm. that Letty has talked about today is in our budget. Right. So um, that would be a conversation that we would have to have about how and where that would happen. And uh, again, there's potential for some contributions from our friends of the library mm -hmm. um, if they were excited and interested in this particular project. I Great. think it would really resonate with them. Mm -hmm. so. Great. Thank hey, you. Just out of curiosity, I mean, we've got a senior apartment literally next door mm -hmm. to, and, and a couple across the street. <laughs> Do we have any idea of um, how easy or not easy it is for those folks to come and visit us? Oh, it's well? very easy. Merrill Park, Merrill Gardens comes over all the time. Okay. Uh, the residents come over for movies, for Tai Chi, for programming. Okay. We see them a lot. All right. So when you're getting towards like the Canterbury or Sunrise. It's a little bit more difficult. Becomes... They would have to have a vehicle. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. Great. Thank you Thank so you, much. Thank you. Thanks, Liddy. Okay, let's move on to the next item. The first reading of the budget, Finance Manager Lou. Good evening, everyone. Um, let me share my screen. I might need to make you a co-host. There we go. Okay. Um, okay. In the packet, uh, I have a memo. Um, you know, laying out uh, the first reading of the budget. Um, this is uh, the first reading and in June, we'll have the final reading for board approval. Um, as of the first reading, uh, we are showing uh, re total revenues of approximately 11.7 million. And um, I'm referring to uh, the blue column. Um, and total expenditures of approximately 12 and a half million for a net uh, shortage of um, just over 800,000. Um, the two primary factors uh, driving that net shortage is a $500,000 uh, proposed uh, additional discretionary payment to CalPERS, um, as well as um, uh, unused uh, capital spending uh, from, from this current fiscal year um, that we're gonna be carrying over to next fiscal year. And that's approximately 300,000. On the revenue side, everything is pretty much as, as expected. I um, anticipated a four and a half percent increase in our property taxes on the secured property tax line item. Um, I actually just got word from LA County that the number is 5%. So for the final reading, I'll um, adjust our revenue higher by approximately 50,000 um, to reflect that. 
but um, property taxes is, is stable and um, it's driving the bulk of our revenue increase. Um, there's also some additional interest income uh, higher by 75,000 year over year uh, due to um, higher uh, average interest rates. On the expense side, there's really just two line, item, line items um, that are, are driving the big increase year over year. Uh, one is salary and related. Year over year, it's higher by 1.1 million. Uh, in the memo, I had five or so, five or six different um, uh, items that I pointed out. Um, the biggest one is the $500,000 in additional discretionary payment to CalPERS. And I'll, I'll come back to that in a, in a couple of minutes. Um, we, we, we do also have um, two additional part-time positions that we placed in there uh, in the budget for the marketing and HR uh, person. And that's just over 100,000. On the fixed assets and software, um, year over year, it's it's higher by approximately 130,000. Uh, you know, typically in, in previous normal years, um, we spend less than 500,000 in fixed assets. Uh, in the past couple of years, th that number has been higher due to the HVAC and the annex and fire life safety. And, and now, you know, we're, we're, we have a lot of um, projects that we've, scheduled in for this coming fiscal year uh, to the tune of 1.6, 1.7 million. Uh, keep in mind that about 300,000 of that is, um, is uh, what we were anticipating to spend this year, but uh, we won't be. So that's, that's gonna create a um, surplus for this year. So instead of um, what we're showing at mid-year of $30, it's gonna be more like somewhere in excess of 300,000. Um, and then one other thing um, down here, the transfer out, I also propose um, moving 750,000 from the general fund to the pension trust fund, um, just to uh, keep, keep ourselves on pace with what the new uh, expected unfunded liability is. Um, those numbers won't be out until August, uh, but the pre preliminary numbers uh, show about 1.8 to 1.9 million of new unfunded liability. Um, we, we were in an overfunded position last year, but due to um, last fiscal year's negative 7.5% uh, return, which was approximately 14% less than what uh, CalPERS um, was targeting, uh, we swung back to a you know, sizable um, unfunded position of 1.8, and it'll grow to over two. And you know, if this year uh, ends at you know three and a half or three percent, it'll it'll be greater than three million in a couple of years. Here, this next slide, I want to just show the. Um, the allocation of the fund balance. So with the deficit of 800,000 plus the transfer out of 750,000 to the pension trust fund, um, we still will have um, sufficient reserves for the six months of operating expenses, um, the subsequent year capital plan, and then the two 5% tranches of operating revenue. The, the, the second 5% of operating revenue right now, I'm showing 96,000, but that's uh, before the um, final numbers for this fiscal year comes in. Uh, I expect that number to be closer to 500,000 with the savings that we'll have from this fiscal year, You know, basically not spending the 300,000 uh, of, of capital improvements. Um, so uh, we're in good position and um, I do recommend that um, we pursue um, pursue this, even though it does show a net, a net shortage. Um, the reason for that is we've 
uh, accumulated reserves over the past three years. Um, so we do have excess reserves we can um, tap into, and these aren't um, structural uh, issues. Um, we're, we're proactively um, spending uh, money on fixed assets sooner rather than later uh, to, um, to address it earlier and not to have any sort of uh, higher costs down the road because I think inflation won't be um, coming down to the 2% level as quickly as the Fed might think it, it can. So um, accelerated spending on the, on the fixed asset side and then also proactively um, keeping, uh, uh, you know, nipping the, the U, UAL in the bud, you know, just trying to not let that get out of hand um, is my recommendation. Um, and with that, it's uh, an, an $814,000 shortage. Now, I wanted to go back to, on a consolidated basis, um, this shows the general fund and the pension trust fund. The asset replacement fund is effectively zero now because we've spent it all, the, asset, the annex project is, is done. And so uh, right now there's just two active funds. Um, you'll see the in the middle of the page, the operating transfer in and out. So the 750 is going out of the general fund and into the pension trust fund. So with, with that, if that happens, um, that will leave our pension trust fund at approximately 1.4 million. Um, so that 1.4 million plus the 500,000 that I'm proposing to pay CalPERS next fiscal year um, is totals up to approximately 1.9 million, which is the unfunded liability that we'll be seeing um, when the report comes out in August. Um, I also have another 500,000 in next year's um, number, but that's just a placeholder for now. But, um, you know, we'll, we'll take it year by year and see where things are after next year. But um, I just want to open up to see if anyone has any questions at this point. So, Will, I, if I understood what you said, um, essentially our budget next year, absent the pension funding and the deferred um, maintenance costs, is a balanced budget. Correct. Yeah. Okay. So, I, mean, I think that's important. Mm -hmm. And um, Using the five hundred thousand to uh, shore up our pension debt, and then essentially transferring three hundred thousand from this year to next year. Yeah, you know, I mean, it, it looks like oh, trust it me, looks, it looks like a deficit, <laughs> but it really isn't. Mm -hmm. I know. Trust me. When Will first showed me, and actually we, we we first looked at it, and it was about seven hundred and fifty, and I, you know, had a little gasp, and then. Um, we actually added in just as a placeholder again, just so that you could see what impact it would have on the budget, that additional part-time um, employee, uh, which brought it up to 814. Um, I completely agree with you. You first look at it and you just think, oh my goodness, what's going on here? But when you dig into it, I think Will's absolutely correct. Taking the 500,000 now and making a payment to CalPERS and then transferring another 750 into our 115 gives us the money in, you know, what, less than two years to basically pay a $2 million debt that we know is coming. It, it is no matter what we do. So we can either prepare for it and utilize those tactics that we've already put in place, like the 115 pension trust fund, or it can catch us off guard and we won't know what we're doing. Um, so I think it was really smart. And yeah, when you look at that, you take those away. And then just some, you know, the capital projects that we're trying to front load mm -hmm. and trying to get those on the books now, take care of them now. So they're as, as cost efficient as they can possibly be. Well, what is what would what is the amount of the excess reserve after you dip into it this year? What's remaining? So as excess. In in my mind, we've 
kind of generated more than two and a half million of excess reserves uh, wow. over the last three years. Um, and, and what I mean by uh, excess reserves is it's, you know, in excess of um, the um, six months of operating uh, expenses mm -hmm. plus uh, plus the emergency reserves. Mm -hmm. um, so we, we've had um, three years where we were better than budget um, mm -hmm. by several hundred thousand. In fact, um, last fiscal year um, at the final reading, our uh, net shortage was 285,000. And that was approved uh, for last fiscal year. Um, but, you know, I think at the end of the day, it'll it'll be a surplus of more than 300,000. So that's a $600,000 swing. Um, and and, and what, what accounts for that is, you know, the 300,000 of um, spillover for, for the capital improvements from this year to next year, not having an election, mm -hmm. um, that's another 170,000. Mm -hmm. um, and then also some vacant uh, positions as well as people on leave. So um, last year we showed a, a deficit of 300,000. It's it's gonna be a surplus of over 300, I believe at the end of the year. Um, and we, we've been, we, we over the last three years, we've been accumulating and kind of saving. and. Mm -hmm. um, I think uh, at this point, I think it's prudent to you know, dip into the reserves to um, to to pay Calpers part of it. I, I wouldn't give Calpers, you know, everything and and get to a hundred percent funded level because if we're in an overfunded position, it's money that we can't really claw back from Calpers if the market does really well. Mm. So I would um, hold back some of that money and in effect just put it in the Section One Fifteen Trust. Um, and, and, you know, and, and CalPERS will still charge a 6.8% on whatever is unfunded. Um, but hopefully we can earn mo most of that back, uh, through gains in the 115 trusts. That's kind of my, my goal. What, what is, what is uh, the LA County fund paying us now in interest? They're, they're at, um, approximately three and three quarters. And, uh, I think it'll, it'll continue to go up. Um, there is a lag um, as their old investments, you know, roll off and they um, invest in, in newer, higher yielding uh, securities. Um, but we're currently at three and three quarters. And so you think the pension fund can, I mean, you never know, but the pension fund can do better than that. Well, you know, it's hard to say um, we're, we're in a roughly 50-50, you know, uh, equity versus debt um, allocation in our 115 trust. Um, I think, you know, after a couple of years of downturn in the market, you know, what what could happen is that the market could, um, could have a better, you know, a, a little bit of a turnaround in the, in the following, two, you know, couple of years. Um, unless we have a lost decade, you know, there have been lost decades where um, the market has been basically flat for like 10 years. Um, hopefully that doesn't happen. If it does, you know, I think that that would be highly concerning. And um, I think a lot of other public agencies would be in a lot worse shape than we are. But barring that, um, I think once interest rates start to um, stabilize and, and not keep increasing, um, that will certainly help um, the equity markets. And, you know, it, it kind of depends on how severe uh, the recession will be if there is a recession. Um, but usually the market, you know, um, so well, I, 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 I kind of see it kind of turning up. As yeah, if you think about it, though, what's well, what's yeah. the horizon for the pension trust fund. When will when do you think we would want to start taking money out of that to uh, pay down the Calpers debt? I, I would say it's kind of an emergency reserve fund in case we have, you know, budgetary issues in our general fund mm -hmm. um, where we don't want to put out the money out of our general fund. But you view I think, it as a long term. You view I, it as I a think long -term it's definitely investment. a long term. Yeah. Um, 
uh, vehicle. I don't anticipate taking any money out um, in the in the next you know few years, um, given where we are with our our reserves and our finances and our, kind of our tenure you know outlook. But um, you know if if the market does horribly over the next few years and and it's flat, then yeah, the picture might change in you know two or three years. So well, maybe you know, maybe you don't. Um, certainly the past 18 months have been very exciting. Uh, we have a very literally a balanced approach to our investing about 50% stock, 50% bond. How are we doing relative to ourselves, relative to our principal contributions in? Are we still down a little bit? Are we yes. up a little bit? Flat? Yes. So the 115 trust we seeded, um, uh, if, if I'm... Uh, Hearing your question correctly, we we seeded that with seven hundred fifty thousand in June of twenty twenty one. Yeah, so we're down to about six forty. Okay. Um, currently, so it's about um it's about uh fourteen fifteen percent uh, lower than two years ago. Okay. Yeah, I mean it is part of what's been going on with the market. Um, and the other question I had, and maybe you know, maybe you don't. And I'm going to give you a lot of leeway. I mean, certainly when we were thinking that the annex was going to be a freestanding structure, we did some uh, paid for some plans and whatnot. We ended up not doing it. So therefore, I'm not going to really consider that part of the actual teen annex that we ended up with. But in the uh, postmortem, did we come on budget, off budget a little bit? How, how did we do? Well, pretty much on budget. Uh, we're a few thousand under uh, uh, under budget um okay. so it's it's right in line where with where we anticipated it to be very good job guys on that one thank you we're four thousand dollars under budget great anybody have any other questions comments well thank you so much this is um uh uh a great presentation um, and I think you have another one uh, <laughs> next. Um, I do. Selection of auditing firm. Yes. So last month, the district issued an RFP for auditing services and a total of three firms submitted proposals. All three firms have the requisite experience and qualifications. Um, after reviewing the proposals, uh, staff's rec recommendation is based um, on our current audit firm, FIDAC and Brown, providing excellent services to the district over the last five years, um, and its successor, successor firm, CJ Brown and Company, providing the lowest cost bid. Uh, the memo uh, shows the total fees by fiscal year. Um, it escalates approximately 2.5% every year, and that's total all-in costs, um, including um, uh, potential out-of-pocket expenses, um, and uh, it is the lowest cost by a not you know, insignificant margin. So um, I, I am recommending uh, to go with CJ Brown um, to uh, be our audit firm. As a reminder, uh, why is it that we put out the RFP? Just do Yes, so um, Feedback and Brown, uh, we've, we've had them for five years. Um, it was a kind of a three-year term with two one-year options. So we're at the end of that. So it was, you know, best practices to just check the market to see, you know, what mm -hmm. other proposals were out there if they were, um, if they were competitive. Um, you know, I I've been very pleased with their professionalism and their services. So um, from that perspective, I didn't see a need to change. But you know, uh, it's always good. Uh, practice to survey the market and that's you know the reason for mm -hmm. going out and um seeing if there were any alternatives that uh, were potentially uh, more cost effective um i know that it's fantastic that we've been working with them and you're making the recommendation um i remember when i first came onto the uh, board of trustees one of the challenges was that the number of firms that were in the business of auditing organizations like ours was basically growing uh, smaller. And so do you feel that we got three responses to our RSP as being healthy? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very much so. Yep. Yes. 
Okay. Um, is there a motion um, connected with this? Okay. Um, yes, please. Uh, do I have a motion to approve uh, the selection of the auditing firm um, finance manager Lou recommended? I so move. All in favor say aye. 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 Uh, any opposed? Motion carries. Thank you, finance manager Lou. Thank you. Welcome. Okay, next we have adoption of resolution number 2023-01, a resolution of the Board of Library Trustees amending the plan agreement with Mutual of America Life Insurance Company. Finance Manager Lou. Yes. <laughs> so uh, the district currently offers voluntary 457 plans through Nationwide Mutual of America. Um, I think at the last board meeting, uh, Trustee Wong asked a question about how many employees were taking advantage of that. So 28 employees or 33% of the district's 86 total employees are currently enrolled in um, one of those uh, two 457 plans. Um, both vendors added a Roth IRA option to their offerings mm. um, and uh, Mutual of America in order to, um, uh, to, to get that going requires a plan amendment um, for participants to enroll. And nationwide doesn't require any such amendment. So um, attached to the memo is a resolution as well as the amendment to the Mutual of America uh, contract um, with the recommendation that the board authorize uh, Jennifer Valadares, the payroll and benefits analyst to facilitate the changes to this contract. Okay, any questions, comments? Uh, just a quick comment, mm -hmm. and just for a little bit of clarity. Uh, there is no financial impact to the district for yes. offering these. It's a hundred percent voluntary to the employees. We just want to be able to. Yeah, it was just option. one organization required that we that we have. resolution. Okay. Um, do I have a motion to adopt uh, the res resolution number twenty twenty three zero one? I move to adopt. Uh, all in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Thank you, Finance Manager Lou. Thank Quick so question much. for Director Addington. Um, do either uh, Nationwide or Mutual of America maybe provide uh, pamphlets that you stick in people's mailboxes just to make them aware? Both of them are actually coming out to give, um, uh, well, actually, it might be via Zoom, okay. but they're both providing an actual um, verbal update to the staff. Mm -hmm. okay. um, and there'll be some information coming from our benefits analyst, Jennifer Valadares. And um, actually uh, finance manager Lou uh, is doing a staff presentation just okay. about you know, general finances and budget and whatnot to uh, educate the staff on what their options are. Yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, I cannot care more for someone than someone cares for themselves, but I really do believe the same for retirement is important. Yeah. yeah, we agree. Great, thank you. Thank you. Uh, next, we have security camera update, uh, system update, IT manager. We're uh, going to have our IT manager come to the podium just so that we have a better microphone for him. So just give us one moment while he squeezes makes his way through. over there, squeezes over there. <laughs> So the purpose here is just to give an update, no action required. Uh, last time we spoke, we talked about the CMAS process and sort of gave a, a, uh, an overview of the project. Since then, we had a project manager switch out the vendor that we've been working with, which is fine. It's not a problem, but that, that was a, a little setback in terms of time. But we have a new team working with us we did a more, uh, had a few meetings, did a more detailed analysis of, well, what we really need, uh, what we're looking for, a number of cameras to place them. We had a uh, pretty detailed walk down at Miralest, and Miralest is what we're going to do first, and then do Malika and Penn Center second. Uh, one issue that came up was, of course, the length of storage time. Right now on the server, we store for one year because of that. We did find a law requiring, well, 
pretty much so. I mean, uh, I guess that's up for discussion, but it does say 365 days for special district libraries. And uh, for our current system, which is a number of limited cameras, we'd have a whole lot more in the new system and better cameras, more uh, you know, cameras that require more space, storage space. Um, so, you know, the question came up, well, do we really need to store for that amount of period or not? Or really the, the method of storage, do we wanna do it on the machine itself the camera itself in this Furcata system, which is nice, or do we only want to store a little in that there and then the rest in the cloud? And so I'm we're in the process of getting a quote back. <clears throat> Should have one by end of day tomorrow. I did push them for today, but uh, they would for mirror less, and we'd look at all the options there. Uh, needless to say, I think we all know that the more you store, the more expensive it's going to be. And matter of fact, some cameras, especially the for some of the 4K, 8K cameras, will not store beyond six months uh, locally. So you'd have to store in the cloud for that anyway. Um, you know, what do a lot of other people do? Well, you know, I we did some research there and and few people store beyond 90 days, of course few people are special district libraries like like we are and and uh and so i i think there's a discussion that was going to still have to happen there but the approach with storing a minimal amount of data on the, on the camera and then the rest of it in the cloud is a good approach so the vendor thought too that a lot of people do that because you could you could uh exercise several options on that would you know, help you with costs and that storage there. So that's where we stand. It's just an, uh, just an update. And I'll probably be back in a month or two just to give you another one. Could you explain the taking minutes? <laughs> well, I'm going to jump in here for a minute too, because I, I think, uh, IT manager Lutowski is tr is being very optimistic mm -hmm. in thinking that there might be any other option than storing 365 days. Uh, when we started investigating this, we actually realized that um, the previous director had investigated this exact same topic in 2016. And in talking to Kevin Ennis of Richard Watson Gershon, we located the memo that was written then um, on this exact topic, uh, and really nothing in the law has changed. And so the advice back then was, yes, as a special district and the way the law is written, we really are required to keep 365 days of uh, surveillance camera. Um, the only option would be similar to what we do for our own public meetings, right? is we, we don't keep the YouTube of these meetings longer than maybe a year, or not even that maybe, um, but we keep very detailed minutes. So they said, well, you could conceivably go through the security cameras and take minutes of anything that happens. But we're like, but what does that mean? Hmm. A car came in, a car drove out, a person walked in, a person walked out. That's ridiculous. There's th 36 cameras going 24 hours a day. Mm. You can't take minutes on that. Could we only take minutes if there was an event? Mm -hmm. Well, what qualifies as an event? Mm -hmm. That somebody fell, that a car bumped a curb? Mm -hmm. So I think even then, the feedback and, and the recommendation from legal was taking minutes was probably going to be far too time consuming, mm. uh, far too inaccurate. And really, how do you determine what you're realistically taking minutes on? You could fast forward and say, we're only going to take minutes if there's something happening. Mm. But for 36 <clears throat> cameras, 24 hours a day, I mean, that's like somebody's whole job. So I don't think it's feasible truly to take minutes. 
Okay. So what we're looking at mm-hmm. now is just the, the honest to God costs. And if we store 30 days on the physical camera and the rest of it in the cloud, can we compress it down in the zippiest of zip files so that it's maybe not even very good quality, but we've kept it? Um, what is acceptable? Uh, the law around this is, a, I don't want to say hazy, but it's not defined. Okay. There are no specific court cases one way or the other. So I think if we kept 30 days on the cameras, 60 days of good quality in the cloud, and then the rest of it as you know, a very compressed file, what would that cost us? And okay. then it'll depend on the costs. And if somebody's able to get us a great deal, and say, look, we can give you, you know, so so quality for 360 days, and you know, keep however much on the cameras themselves. Then it'll all come down to what the costs are. Okay, I, I was hoping that there was some type of development, like of AI, where it's like eight <laughs> hours of nothing happening, but we'll keep that five minutes before and after someone walks through the parking lot. So that may be around the corner. I mean, it- yeah. And so there are places talking to the engineer at Verkata, he goes, there are places that'll, they'll, they'll, they'll have someone go through it. And I guess the devil's in the details, you know, so sometimes people will go through it quickly and they may skip something. Yeah. Other places, they'll be a little more, more, you know, observant and, yeah. and you know, yeah. But yeah, I mean, it, it's it's going to take cost and hours of of, of of somebody's time. But, yeah. you know, being that this technology is developing quickly, who knows, maybe in a year or so or two. Yeah, I know, because you, I mean, you, I'm sure that in an eight hour yeah. period of time, your captures capture a lot of nothing. Mm-hmm. Oh, well, yeah. and it depends on the camera. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, there's hallway cameras that don't capture anything all day long. Mm-hmm. And then there's the main entrance to the library. Yeah. Well, Sometimes it's not an event that you end up going back and looking at. Sometimes it's just, did that individual walk in? And what time did they walk in? Because there was an event three hours later in a completely different part of the library. But if you're trying to establish somebody's movement throughout the library, you know, you, how would you ever know that that was an event or not? What, what's, so. the, what's the criteria for non special district libraries? Um, I, I don't think it's necessarily libraries per se. It's like um, uh, the way the government code says, uh, it says something about government code section for purposes, video recordings, including recordings of routine video monitoring. So for any governmental facility, um, shall be considered duplicate of the special district, blah, blah, blah. A video recording medium shall not be destroyed uh, in this section for at least 90 days after the occurrence of the event. This is if there's an event going on. Um, I mean, there's just all kinds of laws and codes around government surveillance. We were even saying at one point, is it really a surveillance camera or is it just a monitoring camera? Could we find some, you know, some wiggle room there? And again, the feedback from legal was you're gonna start walking on thin ice when you start to purposely look for some way to circumvent 365 days. If you're trying to not do what you think the code is telling you to do, then you've got a problem. So, you know, we looked, we tried, they looked back in 2016. And at that point, Uh, legal advice even gave some suggested policy changes. Mm -hmm. And what we noted is that every one of those policy changes, with the exception of the retention one about minutes, was in fact adopted back in 2016. So it looks like the district and the board at that time, they did look at it, they did talk about it, and they decided that this particular thing was just not feasible taking minutes but they adopted the other policy suggestions from legal. Um, And it was just one of those things that, you know, you see how things come back up, you know, here Mm -hmm. we are from 2016 to 2023, trying to see the same thing. And yet there's been no 
legal changes. So they really couldn't advise anything other than the same advice that was given in mm -hmm. 2016. So from a practical standpoint, um, have we ever had to go back and retrieve Nine. videos? I think from the longest six, we've had is maybe 90 days. We had yeah. one yesterday that was six months. No, that was six months. <laughs> it was so. just popped up. You know, we had just had conversations, many resulting from this discussion <laughs> of we've never had to go back more than 90 days. <laughs> and then yesterday we have a patron who thinks somebody used their card fraudulently to check out a laptop and and get and just leave with yeah. it, you know. But that was back in December, early December, end of end of November. So mm -hmm. we had the footage there. We were yeah. Show, so. And it's, I think there again, what is an incident? We've gone back because people have said somebody did something to my vehicle. Mm -hmm. Is there anything that happened? We've had police officers come in and say, can you go back and look at two o'clock in the morning on your roof that, that this car and this car might have driven up there? And we've been able to do it. But yeah, until yes. yesterday, yeah. I yeah. would have said no longer than three months. But yeah. and that's months. the no, that's the, the norm yes, is is months. within you know a month. You know, very seldom is there something that pops up that isn't reported immediately if it's right. if it's of some concern. So it's, it's rare, but it does happen. But it does happen. Mm -hmm. That's right. Mm -hmm. And then that's why these Bob. laws are probably mm -hmm. on the books. Yeah. You know? So. Bob, so just looking for the cheapest way to, uh, to store that to data. store it yeah. for the requ legally required time. Is yep. what we have to do. So, Bob, talking to a lot of the libraries in SCLA or even outside of that and talking to the implementation engineer at Vercata, so very few people will store beyond 90 days. Uh, and the ones that do are they, they're required by municipal code, but the but I have to emphasize that none of these are special district libraries mm -hmm. like us. So our hands are, are, <laughs> yeah. are tied by this, yeah. this one law. The, yeah. the, there's actually two laws. There's a whole separate law for municipal, which is also a year. So for those public and kind of Jennifer yeah. was talking about the government entities, they're, they're under the same one year restriction. The private kind of companies don't have to worry about that kind of thing. But, it, but there's one law for special districts and there's one law for other government entities that aren't. But, but the idea of us being able to get the law changed since it's so broadly described mm -hmm. You know, it's not just unique to libraries, no, but I do no. feel like not going to happen. So no. CSDA has made that effort in the past. I think they've too. tried yeah. and they get a lot of pushback because yeah. what are you hiding? We don't care what it costs. Yeah. What What is the, the cost right now for that? Um, well, right now we're storing locally mm. on our own so servers. We, mm. To use a technical term, we had to buy a pretty big, beefy server, mm -hmm. a lot of storage space and to store that. And since we're going to a system that, well, more cameras, sharper images, you would need more storage space. But the idea in this new system really isn't to store it on a server. It's really more to store it on the camera or in the cloud. Mm -hmm. uh, anyway, so you know, that was a cost. And, and back then when we bought it and to maintain that, so, and it's, you know, it, it could it could fail at any time too. I mean, mm -hmm. it's a high, it's a pretty real, highly reliable server and all that. But you know, you always have that 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 factor also to consider when it's in house. Mm -hmm. So, okay, you know, if if we could we could put most of it in the cloud, that would be a good deal. Yeah. Well, thank you, thank you for the update. Yeah, so. Thank you, Laz. Sure. Okay. Um, we have next facilities update. Facilities Manager Gutierrez. Hello, good evening. Um, we were, uh, I'll start with the roof. Uh, we were actually <laughs> able to complete the roof and open the roof on May 1st like was planned. Um, we were striping it 
at uh, 11 o'clock at night on April 30th. So uh, we came down to the wire, but everything was able to open up and then we were able to also open up the annex on May 1st to the public. So um, that all happened according to plan. Um, it's going really well. We got a good test really fast because it rained on Wednesday and Thursday. And for the first time in 55 years, it did not leak inside of the library. <laughs> so um, yeah, really. <laughs> that was fantastic. So. That was a breath of relief because you never know until it actually is tested, you know? So um, we're gonna be starting to slowly go around and collect all of our rain collecting apparatus that we have in <laughs> the library and uh, put portions of the ceilings back. And um, we're getting really good feedback from the people in the annex. We're getting a lot of, um, you know, kids coming through. I think uh, the other day they said like they had like 50 kids come through the annex in that single day and I was very impressed and and uh, it's usually pretty crowded when I go up there. So um, that's been So it's really getting fantastic. more use than the old one. Oh yeah. 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 Um, I think so. Ta just talking with the annex staff, they're surprised with the amount of uh, people that are coming through, kids that are coming through. Um, and that's what Otto said. He says it's way more than what was across the street so mm -hmm. far. So. I think the accessibility just yeah. makes it more convenient. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That synergy yeah, between they the They can just walk area. upstairs. Mm -hmm. yeah. it, is, it is also new and shiny and has yeah. all of the favorite things that they've got right now. But, yeah. you know, I, I think it's, uh, you know, being very successful currently. So those are two really big things to check off. Uh, they're done. We're closing those out right now. Um, and then... Uh, Last uh, board meeting, I talked about the water damage that was on the eastern side of the building, and we are getting pricing for what it's going to cost to kind of investigate what's going on. Uh, luckily, during our initial probing of the space, a lot of the problems happen on a concrete slab, so there's not going to be water damage behind the actual front fascia. So that's a huge relief because now we know that it's just mainly that front fascia and that stucco. And we do need to rip it off and repair it before it starts falling off. But, um, but at least there's not damage on the back end. Um, we've been working a lot with uh, soils engineers, topographical, civil engineers, and structural engineers for the entryway at Deep Valley slash terrace job. Um, we've gotten our as-built together, and then we just got the topographical today. We've been signing contracts, paying deposits, and moving forward to gather all of the information so that we have everything to start creating a plan and to you know approve on the design ideas that we've got for that. It's still going to be a process. Um, we've had them, the ones that have delivered have had cancellations in the area and we went ahead and just said, yes, come, come out. But a lot of them still say that it's like four to six weeks before they get out to us and then another four to six weeks before they actually give us a deliverable. So um, we're, we're keeping on all of that and busy with all of that. But uh, yeah, things are going good. That the close out of the roof and the annex were really, uh, really big ones. Fantastic. Thank you. Any, Any questions? questions? Uh, Daniel, what's the uh, construction time for the, our part of the redo of the entryway on the main library? As in how long it'll take? Yeah. We don't really know that until we actually get the plans together because then we can get you know, a timeline from contractors on what that'll take. A lot of it depends on what we get back from the soils analysis as well because that'll tell us if we actually need to like dig down and, and lay foundational materials underneath um, because the nature of the building that we're going for is to have a paver stone so that if they move, we can bring them up and we can set them down. But they they still need a foundation underneath them. And if it's just expansion soil there, we might need to dig out and put them there so that it mitigates what's happening in the future. So that all depends. If, if we get back positive information, that's going to be great. If we get back negative information, we're going to have to do a little bit more and then it'll take a little bit longer. Mm -hmm. well, just, it would just be nice if we had that done before the next rainy season. That's all. Yes, uh, we're trying, but then we, we've got to go through you know, design, then we've got to go through permitting. And then, so yeah, it's okay. probably not going to be until like, you know, I'm hoping next spring we'll be able to start on the construction of that. We're probably not going to get it through the fall and into winter, right. but uh, yeah. Terrific. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Okay, statistical comparison data update, Deputy Director Roy. Yes, thank you. So the statistical comparison is, is a continuation of a conversation that we started earlier this year. Um, the basic thought was let's take some of the statistics we've gathered from pre-COVID and kind of look at our, our first, you know, year, our 2022 year, because we had put out our, our 22, 2022 year in review, and that kind of sparked this conversation. So mm -hmm. um, we picked a few, you know, we have, you know, a, a wealth of stats that we can look at and we can discuss. Um, it does take a little bit of time to, to create slides. So, you know, just the general kind of thought is that it, if there's any areas that we want to look at, we can discuss that and then bring something back. Mm -hmm. um, but just to start, we picked out a few categories and uh, we're, we're pleasantly surprised in most of them. Uh, you can see from the memo that uh, PVLD cardholders was actually more than it was pre-pandemic. Uh, our PVLD circulation is higher than it was in 2018. So we're, oh, can I share my screen? So let's see here. Uh, it's possible. Okay. So I, I'm just kind of whizzing through here because one of the thoughts was to look at where there is kind of aberrations between what it was pre-pandemic and what it was now. So just, you know, scrolling through these at first, uh, you can see there that that it's not majorly up in 2022 than it was from 2018 and 2019. This is average cardholders, um, but it is a little bit higher and it's on par. Uh, same for circulation. It's a little bit higher than it was in 2018 and 2019. So that's continuing to, to tell us that we're back to where we were. You know, we've recovered. Uh, what we're not seeing in those intervening years of 2020 and 2021 is the big dip from COVID and the building back. So um, what you would have seen if we'd have included a bigger graph here is just the drop off and the build back up. Um, one of the things I'll talk about a little bit later is that in a lot of these areas, we're still seeing the build back up. So we're not, all the way to where we hope to be in some of the areas. But obviously door count, um, we're still just a little bit higher. Um, I'm running through this very quickly, but I'll, I'll give plenty of time to ask questions because I really wanted to focus on the ones that had the big aberrations like the PVLD programs. So you can see here that between you know, 2019, our last fully open year to 2022, uh, there was a pretty big drop off in programming. Um, one very important thing to point out here was that we did not bring back indoor in-person programming until mid-March of 2022. So we've got almost the first quarter there where we're not doing that indoor programming. Um, so that, that's a significant kind of chunk that's going to be missing from these statistics that we will see gaining back uh, when we do a full year of 2023. Um, we're also still building back programming, which we'll see uh, one of the things in the conclusion was that we expect this trend to rise from 2023 to 2024. Uh, we expect to see that rise for the next couple of years. Um, so the other big kind of determining factor in why this is so low is that um, our story times that we had pre-pandemic accounted for a lot of these numbers that you see up here. So we had uh, at our height was 15 weekly story times, which even before the pandemic, we were strategizing on how, how we can pull that back. It was, it was a lot for our staff. It was more than we needed. We had taken a strategy up to that point of, you know, if our story times are popular, let's add another one. Um, that one's popular too, let's, let's add another one. Um, what we found was that generally a lot of the same families were attending. It was a lot of the same people, the caregivers or parents that were there were, were, were pretty much, you know, recognizable faces from crowd to crowd. So it's a very difficult thing to pull back something that you've given to the community. Mm -hmm. And in that sense, um, we, we really had an opportunity when we closed for COVID to really think through that and how we wanted to bring it back. So story times were phased back um, very incrementally, starting with our very first story times at Malaga Cove out here in the, 
in the garden gallery. Um, so those were the very first kind of ones that we had when we came back from the pandemic. Of course, during the pandemic, we did have the online story times uh, that people could attend virtually and those were on the website and on YouTube. Um, but the first in-person were outside and then we eventually phased back in uh, story times in the library, which started with just a couple of weeks. And then we uh, eventually settled on four. And then just recently, we've kind of rethought through the story time. We have a new story time schedule. We've added a couple of new ones um, that, are, that are a little bit different than the traditional story time, which are, um, you know, we have some play times. We've moved to an eight week schedule where we rotate which days we do at which libraries. So the whole story time structure has really, we've put a lot of thought into it. Our um, adults, I mean, our young readers manager, Laura Henry and her team have really gotten together and, and designed a, a schedule for how it should look and what, what the community needs. And, and so what this statistic is not reflecting was that first three months where we weren't even interior, and then a big chunk of this is going to be when we were doing two a week, you know, then four a week. And what we'll see kind of moving into 2023 is going to be getting up to that six a week. So that, that accounts for a lot uh, of programming. So I think uh, in my board report and, and I'll stop this sharing here so I can. Oops. Oh. <laughs> Um, so, I have a quick question about yeah, sure. that slide. Um, do you find that the programs um, are similar to the programs that you had pre-pandemic? Have you added new programs? Yes, uh, and we're still in the process of adding programs. Mm -hmm. There are, are new things that we think through. We have a monthly programming committee where mm -hmm. we get together and we talk through um, suggestions that we've gotten from the community. We talk through our own thoughts and suggestions. We come up with with new ideas. Um, there have been, you know, new uh, regularly scheduled programs added. So we're seeing these things add up. You know, we'll mm -hmm. we'll definitely see these numbers continue to rise. Like for instance, you know, on the adult side, you know, we had a tea in the library program, and this was. Kind of what we consider like a more of a passive program where we roll out a tea cart it's actually right there in the library and it's it, it was not you know a big draw for a lot of people but it counted as a program so mm -hmm. that when you discontinue this kind of program post covid that's the number of 50 programs that doesn't show up mm -hmm. in that statistic um so there are other you know weekly monthly programs that are have been developed since these 2022 statistics mm -hmm. um, are posted. And that's why um, we know for a fact that the 2023 numbers will be significantly higher. And we even expect 2024 to be more because we've developed things over the course of 2023 that we'll see as recurring programs that had all of 2024. So mm -hmm. it's just going to be numbers that we expect to rise um, for the next at least you know couple of years of mm -hmm. statistics gathering. Um, the other um, statistic that we we looked at, and I'm I'm not sharing anymore, so I'm not sure if you if you have this, but all my notes are on a different screen. Were the volunteers? Mm -hmm. um, so this is another number that is continuing to build. Mm -hmm. um, but one of the factors that really plays into what this statistic looks like on paper is how we collect the statistics for volunteers, which is drastically different than what it was pre-pandemic. So pre-pandemic, we had just uh, notebooks with paper in them at every you know, volunteer area. And when you volunteered, you just you know, logged in, how many hours you work, and we were able to calculate these. And really they got submitted into our statistics as two numbers, which is the total the total number of uh, volunteers that were working and then the total number of hours that were volunteered all together. Mm -hmm. And then uh, during the pandemic, um, one of the things you know, we decided to do coming back to that was, was basically modernize this data collection method and, and use it through a web form where instead of logging it on a piece of paper, they can go to any device that they have. You can bookmark this website. You can do it on stations that we've set up in the library. You could do it from your laptop, from your phone, and just go to that website and 
click your name, what area you work in and how many hours that you've worked. Um, what that allows us to do is basically sort a spreadsheet to really get a more versatile data set. So we could look at things much easier than we were able to look at, you know, just having it on paper. So if we wanted to see, you know, how many volunteers we had um, in a single department or how many hours and how, then that in the past would entail going to gather up those notebooks and kind of looking, you know, painstakingly at a certain time period in a certain collection of notebooks. Whereas now it's at the push of a button in a spreadsheet. Mm -hmm. So uh, one of the drawbacks to this is just kind of getting the volunteer participation in logging your hours. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, we part of our onboarding process is teaching the volunteers how to do this, where you can go, you can bookmark this, you can do it on your phone. Um, but then, you know, the, we're not getting 100% participation from volunteers in logging their hours. So um, over the past few months, we've really been looking at how to remedy that. What are some strategies to kind of up that participation? Um, we've come up with a way to kind of audit volunteer hours where we can take our active volunteer spreadsheet and just compare that from one department to what we're seeing logged for that department and say, oh, we have you know, seven active volunteers in this department, but we're only seeing, you know, four people logging hours. So we can then just give a heads up to that volunteer manager, whoever the, the manager of that volunteer department is and say, do you think anything's missing from this month? Because this is all we've got logged. And that gives us a heads up that we can reach out to individual volunteers and, and just kind of find out, you know, if there's anything going on, can we help you? Do you need more training? Um, we've, offered to log volunteer hours for some of our volunteers who are less technologically oriented. Maybe they don't feel comfortable with that. That's perfectly fine. We do have um, some volunteer managers who just let us know this volunteer worked this many hours, we can log that for them, it's no problem. Um, we've also kind of updated some of the language on that volunteer page to make it a little more clear that it doesn't have to, if you miss it that day, that's perfectly fine. Mm -hmm. um, for our statistics gathering, as long as you get your volunteer hours by that last day of the month logged in, then we're going to, it'll be counted and it'll be fine. So some people kind of fall into the routine of, hey, I know that I normally work, you know, a six volunteer hours in a week and they do it at the end of the week. They just log their six hours and that's perfectly fine as well. Um, so working through that kind of, of issue, making sure that all of the volunteer hours that are being worked are being counted is going to help get our number back up. Um, we've also seen that um, we are getting more volunteers. We have more volunteers now in many of our library departments than we had pre-pandemic. Um, we, we're not seeing as many volunteers in some of the Peninsula Friends of the Library departments as they had pre-pandemic, um, especially in the book sales, um, which is intentional. Um, the book sale managers have assessed their workflow, what works well for them, and they believe you know, that they've got a good number going on for what they wanna put out. Um, so uh, we feel like um, unless we hear a feedback from them that they need a whole lot more volunteers, then, then we're gonna let them work at, at the capacity that they're currently working at. So part of that then is the different world that we live in post COVID. And um, some departments may never be higher than what they were um, pre COVID. And uh, in a lot of cases that's intentional um, and we wouldn't expect it to get all the way back up. But what we do expect to see for volunteers just as we did for programming is is a increase year over year for the next couple of years in the numbers that um, that are going to be reported through our statistics. So that's the general broad overview of the slides that we have looked at here. We're perfectly happy to answer any questions you may have about these. And again, couple, if there's other couple quick questions. Sure. So I mean, it, the, the inference I'm getting is that because there's a manager supervisor who is being custodian of the logbook, maybe that was the mechanism to make sure that the hours got logged? So we have the same mechanism now um, in, in just that the managers are aware that, you know, 
the the volunteers need to be logging hours and can encourage it there's different ways to do that through you know email communication through signs and we communicate that as well through um sarah who's doing our volunteer coordinating our hr manager sarah uden so um perhaps it was a little easier for them to see when somebody hasn't logged when it was on paper if they were going through the books but um but even i'm not then, sure how often yeah, they did that yeah. even then it's up to the volunteer to to yeah. go to that paper log okay. sign their name and add mm -hmm. their hours okay yeah. just like it's up to the volunteer to go to either as a uh, deputy director roy said one of the dedicated terminals or get it on their phone or use it on their laptop to log their hours okay and we always prided on the fact that we had all these volunteers because it was somehow like a proxy indication of community participation. But we also were very appreciative of all of the uh, work that they provided for us. Mm -hmm. So just in practical terms, is all of the work that need, we need to get done getting done? Or are we still lacking in some way? No, I think all the work that we would need from volunteers is absolutely getting done. Okay. I mean, you have to think, or just please know, we still have over 150 volunteers. Yeah. Uh, like active everyday volunteers. There's, I mean, I know we've got like, you know, a thousand here and we have to look at how that, that, that is actually calculated, but yeah. active over everyday volunteers we have more than some of my peers in libraries have you know 10 times over mm -hmm. so what we need from volunteers we're absolutely getting yeah and if we needed volunteers to like really step up and do like a doors open peninsula kind of event we absolutely can draw them in. I mean, we not only have access to the service groups, the moms and daughters and, you know, kids like that, but if we called for help, we would get it. Okay. I think, you know, people have asked before, you know, how do you know if you have the right number or how do you know if you, if you have as many as you need? And I've said this and I will continue to say it. If the departments say that they're good, then that's enough volunteers. Yeah. If they need volunteers, then we get them volunteers. But if you're okay, and we have volunteers in book sales, in technical services, all of our computer docents are volunteers. We have volunteers in the passport office. We have volunteers who help with the Tech Nose program, which was the kind of tech for seniors program. So yeah, as far as what we need from volunteers, we're absolutely getting. Okay. We've most recently been able to get over 20 volunteers just for the DOPE program itself, you know, just call out who would like to volunteer for this. And we've got a response of over 20. So. Okay. It, it, um, would you be able to tell us at the end of the year or maybe just mark it that let us know how these statistics are playing out um, as per prediction yeah so i think one of the things we can do that we've kind of started with this past year is that year in review kind of one sheet page okay and then um you know yeah yeah we can have that ready you know we do you know take uh, you know a little while to gather the statistic at the end of the month so i think it would probably sure. be february when we would be able to have that so sure. it would be about mid-january when we do it some probably would miss the January board packet, but mm -hmm. um, in February, we could do a new year in review and keep keep looking at this. And, sure. Uh, yeah. That would be great. Mm -hmm. Any other questions or comments? Thank you for the thorough research on that. Yeah, sure. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, we have the district director's monthly report next. Director oh, Addington. Uh, thank you very much. Um, because I know you have a full report in your packet. I'll keep mine short. And I know we're um, getting uh, down there. And I know you guys have had a long day already. Mm -hmm. um, I, I wanted to call out the completion of the annex and, of course, the roof uh, waterproofing, which was just a really phenomenal job. Um, uh, I also just wanted to say that, uh, you know, I'm sure you've seen in the news 
a lot of talk around book challenges and book banning. And I'm just been especially pleased with especially some of the work that Lessa Palaya Lozada has done as our current ALA president and of course, assistant manager of our uh, adult services department in um, advocating for and supporting um, the challenges to any of those book bans and challenges. And I put a link in here to uh, a couple of uh, events that she did an interview with the Amun Koren mm -hmm. company, which I thought was really great and um, the site Unite Against Book Bans, which is a, a really wonderful site. So just wanted to call that out as something that, to please check out if you haven't had a chance to. And then the other thing I wanted to say is, um, you know, we do recognize our volunteers. And one of the thing we, uh, things we did in April was celebrate National Volunteer Week. Even something as simple as a bag with some cookies and a card on it that says, thank you for what you do. Thank you for being a part of us. That's been something that um, we're very pleased and happy to do. The other thing that I'm doing is actively talking to the friends, and you may have noticed in the budget, and perhaps we should have called it out, that um, in conversation with the president of the Friends of the Library uh, and uh, a little bit in um, the book sale liaison in Ron DeFries and Ray Randall about the library taking on more of the responsibilities of truly organizing the volunteers. Mm. Uh, as it stands right now, when you volunteer for the library, you are in fact volunteering for the library. We onboard you, you're covered by workers comp through the library. Mm -hmm. And um, you know if something should happen to you while you're here volunteering, it would be our responsibility as the district to take care of you. Uh, I think that, uh, given the way our policy around volunteering is, it actually is also our responsibility to ensure that you have a safe workplace, that if there's any issues in the workplace that we follow up, and um, even uh, to follow up with recognition. Mm -hmm. So I'm talking to the friends about uh, changing and updating our volunteer policy to better reflect that the district really is in charge of volunteers. Um, the friends are very on board with that. They're still very positive and supportive and uh, want to be financially supportive of our volunteer program, but understand that the implementation of it, the supervision of it does in fact fall to the district. So uh, as soon as we get that done, we'll be bringing an updated policy to the board for all of you to look at and review. And we're working on that now. Um, so I just wanted to call that out. And then the other thing I wanted to say was, um, we talked a little bit about this at our last board meeting, but uh, I'm sure you all know that we do have a health insurance committee here mm -hmm. that is a joint committee from uh, represented employees, management, and one member, uh, Trustee Park, is our uh, board liaison on that committee. And um, they recently put out an RFP for a new benefits broker. They got three submissions back on that RFP, and they're currently being reviewed by the committee. So the process, and I wanted to ensure that we all kind of were on the same page with this, the process as we understand it going forward is that the two final brokers, the, I think with only three, I think the committee feels fairly confident that they'll be able to push two forward. The two final brokers will do presentations to both the staff and then they'll come to the board at the June meeting. So at the presentation to the staff, the staff will be able to ask questions and um, you know, get some clarity and have a rating sheet that they'll be able to give some feedback, some rating on both of those potential vendors. The board will have the same access. The uh, brokers will present to the board. The board will be able to ask questions. Um, and they'll be able to provide input uh, through a rating sheet and, you know, how did you think this person dealt and how did you think that one did? And then ultimately, all of that information will be gathered up by the committee. And then the committee, using their own rubric based on, you know, how the people met the, the specifics of the RFP, plus how they interact with the staff or how they've, uh, you know, uh, said that they would interact, what kind of customer service they would get, the committee would ultimately be empowered to choose, given all the feedback from the staff and the board, the final um, 
broker and then work through the director to get that broker on board. There's definitely a timeline involved because we do need to move forward with it. And I think one of the things that we really felt was, you know, the benefits broker at this point, the one we have at the moment, Keenan, there is no financial impact on the district. It's really about dealing with them, what they bring forward, what kind of benefits they bring forward, and the customer service that they provide. And so really the, the truly impacted individuals are, of course, the staff who have to deal with those individuals, and then the staff who are uh, taking on the, uh, you know, looking and trying to assess what kind of benefits that we're going to provide. Um, if there were to be some sort of just, just complete misalignment between what the board thought and then what the staff in general thought, then we would probably have to revisit that. But I don't envision that. I mean, I think that sometimes it's fairly clear when one person kind of one agency kind of rises to the top and rather than have to bring everything back to the board, it was always our intention that then the committee itself would be empowered to move forward. So unless the board feels differently, that is absolutely how we anticipated going forward, getting feedback from the staff, getting feedback from the board, and then empowering the committee. That's why we create them. That's why we trust them to do the job that they do, to then select a broker that will work with staff and kind of move that process forward. Um, so is this a agenda item for on the agenda for next month or it are you just not. not? Okay. Well, the brokers are. The brokers yeah. are, yes. So okay. that'll be, like we were saying, they're gonna come and they're gonna present. Okay. So I had that listed in my report and I just wanted to clarify okay. that that's kind of what we're gonna do going forward. Right, okay. Um, and then in recognizing our staff, I just wanted to say that this month's Pay It Forward Award winner was John Jacobson, our IT administrator. Um, well, well, well deserved, wonderful, wonderful IT um, frontline administrator. I think we all know that um, yes. if you need something and want something, um, John is the guy to help you out. So very, very well deserved. Everything else I'll leave you to investigate on your own. As always, if you have any questions about my report or anything, please feel free to reach out. And I'll leave it at that. Is the summer palooza also for as adults again this year? Oh yeah, okay. I mean the, every year. The Rita palooza is there will be an adult, a children's, a teen uh, for everybody. Okay, yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, we have a um, some reports. Uh, Community relations committee report. Trustee Butler. Mm -hmm. In the past month, there've been quite a bit of uh, community relations activity, some of which were already mentioned earlier in, in this evening's meeting. <laughs> I just wanted to acknowledge and congratulate the, the Chamber of Commerce. I think their inaugural uh, State of the Peninsula breakfast earlier this month went really well. And uh, all four mayors uh, spoke, and I think it was a good opportunity for all of us and everyone here on the board and Director Addington, we were all there together. So I thought that was a great event. Um, uh, basically just looking forward to the next four weeks, uh, mm -hmm. hoping to support uh, engaging as many stakeholders and other community leaders as we can for the doors open peninsula making that a huge and memorable success so that's thank it. you for all your work on that um peninsula friends of the library liaison report trustee uno and trustee park i wasn't able to attend okay trustee park do you have any updates yes um I guess following on what Director Addington said, she told the Friends Board basically what she told our board now regarding how she's going to approach sort of, sort of re resetting the relationship between the library and the Friends. Mm. And she got a very positive response from the Friends Board. So I think they're, they won't have any problems with what it is. So I think that's good. Uh, the staff did give a very nice presentation on weddings at Malaga Cove Plaza, and mm -hmm. it was uh, got a lot of questions, and uh, they did a good job on that. Uh, the friends are in the process of interviewing for a new director. They've hired a consultant to uh, help them find a person. They've got quite a few candidates, mm -hmm. and they've begun the interview process, so hopefully within the next month or so, they'll be able to make a selection. And then uh, finally, uh, 
when you walk into the uh, main library now, you see uh, the, the big sign about the puzzle that they're selling. And uh, so whatever we can do to uh, help promote that puzzle will be good. They've got an, uh, an initial run, I think, of a thousand. Great. So it would be nice if we could sell all of those thousand um, and uh, get some more. So that's it. Okay. Wonderful. Um, what, the discussion about the resetting uh, the relationship, that's not just the volunteers, but overall? Well, it mostly focused on the volunteers. Mo yeah. Mostly I focused mean, on right, the volunteers. Yes. It's really just about okay. Volunteers. Just right. wanted to clarify that was yes. really focused on the volunteers. Okay. Right. <laughs> Excuse me. Government Relations Liaison Report. Um, so I had the opportunity to go to the California Special District's Legislative Days um, this past week. Uh, it was on Tuesday and Wednesday this week. Uh, Director Addington was with me. Uh, the 2024 date has been announced, so mark your calendars in case you guys want to go. It is May 21st and 22nd, so they've already announced that date. Um, between now and the we have a June meeting? Yes. Okay. So between now and the June meeting, if any of the trustees are curious, um, this is a folder, uh, participants folder. I will put this in my mailbox. So if you want to see what an intact participants kit looks like, uh, it'll be there for you to peruse. Um, I think that this uh, last legislative days was pretty significant because the format was really very much akin to what the format was pre-COVID, uh, although they have tinkered with it a little bit to go ahead and make it fresh um, for individuals like me who've been quite a few times. So for example, in the morning, there was a breakfast, there was some opening greeting comments. Um, they spoke of some top of mind issues this uh, year. They were talking about uh, community facilities, water, environmental programs, a lot of talk about fire, drought, and flood. Don't know why. <laughs> um, there was the Legis Legislator of the Year uh, presentation. In this case, this year was Senator John Laird. Um, also, Little Hoover Commission Chair Pedro Nava spoke about the work of the Little Hoover Commission. Um, again, they talked a lot about legislation that was pending that was of concern uh, to CSDA because they felt it could affect special districts such as ours. And this is where it parted a little bit. Um, they left a bracket of time available so that we as participants could go on our own to the legislative uh, offices to go ahead and petition and lobby our legislators. And I think the reason why is because I didn't realize this. They are in the process of uh, unbuilding the uh, state capital annex. And so therefore all of the legislators have moved to an office building about a mile away mm -hmm. uh, from the Capitol. And then afterwards, there was a little reception where typically uh, legislative staff um, and uh, legislators would go. In this year, I think it was mostly uh, uh, CSA participating, just rubbing elbows. Mm -hmm. And um, day two, again, um, discussing those specific um, pending legislation that they want us as participants to go ahead and speak to our uh, specific uh, legislator about trying to get their support. Um, and then some closing issues, comments, and then, you know, dash for the airport. Um, but like I said, um, the format is very much like it was pre-COVID. Uh, with some refreshing um, accents to go ahead and just change up a little bit. And uh, for those trustees who've never done it, I recommend that you do it at least once in your trustee career. Um, it's a very interesting uh, meeting and I think it's a good uh, life experience. Thank you. Um, thank you for the thorough report. Um, uh, when trustee Uno and I uh, helped update that policy 8,000 we talked about, um, when trustees travel to conferences to give a, an oral or written report. And so we appreciate 
um, your uh, feedback uh, to us. And one other thing, there is uh, um, a desk that the trustees could use to read this kind of material. So I'm wondering if um, Executive Assistant Bender can take that uh, the material and when we're coming through there, we could take a look. Sure, we'll leave yeah. it at the desk. Thank you. Um, items for future agendas. Um, so just as a reminder, the June meeting is moved back to Peninsula Center. Mm -hmm. So we will be at Peninsula Center. Um, just as another quick reminder, it is the same evening as the doors open Peninsula reception. So uh, La Venta Inn for an hour, an hour and a half, jump back to Peninsula Center for our meeting. So at the June meeting, we'll go over the final reading of the budget. Um, there should be ideally a conversation about director's compensation that has to be done in a public open meeting. So we cannot mm -hmm. discuss that um, behind the scenes. Um, we will have the presentation of the top two uh, benefits brokers. Um, um, Cal per salary schedule, but that's just consent. GAN limits, that's just consent. So the biggies are the final reading, potential director compensation discussion, and of course the presentation of the two final um, benefits brokers. I'm sure there may be something else mm -hmm. that comes up between now and then, but at least for now, those are the givens. Will there be one um, meeting this calendar year held at Merrill West? The next one, which uh, it, so we'll meet at Peninsula Center uh, in June. July is dark. And in August, we will be at Mira Lest Library. So the August meeting. Is Mira Lest. It's Mira Lest. Right. And then we'll go back. Okay. Well, I think that concludes our meeting. And I look at the time, it's 8.16, a few minutes earlier than last time. Um, but thank you for uh, everybody's input tonight. Uh, do I have a motion to adjourn the meeting? I move to adjourn. Okay, all in favor say aye. 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 Okay, motion carries. Thank you, everyone.